Next, we have uh, Miriam Foot. Miriam Foot was awarded a Doctor of Letters and is a Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London. She is the former director of a collections and preservation at the British Library, is Emeritus Professor of Library and Archive Studies at University College London, where she taught historical bibliography preservation as part of a collection management course in advanced preservation. She has published extensively books and articles on the history of bookbinding, the history of decorated paper, and a number of preservation topics. She gives regular papers at conferences all over Europe and the United States. For the volume, she contributed on, uh, with a piece on recipes for gilding. Miriam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was delighted to hear Nicholas' presentation. Um, and I think Chris would have both approved and disapproved of the topic of my own article for his, what is now have become a memorial volume for him. Um, Nicholas mentioned that Chris liked precise terminology. The medieval recipes on which I've been working are everything but precise. They talk about a pinch of this, a handful of that, uh, a measure without um, any indication of what measure of the other, a pot, heat until you cannot feel it, uh, you know, completely imprecise. On the other hand, there are also remarks that Chris would have approved of, and that is, do this until it is beautiful. And if it is not beautiful, go on doing it. And I'm sure Chris would have agreed to that. My research into this medieval manuscript recipes for gold tooling and gilding of books and book ed bindings and edges um, ran parallel with my work on bookbinders manuals, early bookbinders manuals of the 16th to the 18th centuries. Medieval recipes for making gold, making colors, applying gold, using tools, um, how to um, lay on the gold, go back to the 11th century um, and find their origin into three important Arabic manuscripts. In the West, we have to wait also till the 11th century when the first medieval recipes appeared. Now, they, they were not bookbinders manuals at all. These recipes appeared in compendia about almost anything under the world, anything technical, anything to do with alchemy, with chemistry, medical recipes, um, a whole mixture. And I read to a number of these manuscripts, both in Latin, in French, and in Dutch, um, at the Welcome Library in London, which is in fact a medical library, where, as they also had a lot of stuff about recipes for medications, um, they were there perfectly suitable. But I learned a great deal about um, medieval alchemy, because what they were really, really after was how you make gold out of nothing. And of course, they couldn't. Um, and in a way, that was not the point for me. The point for me was once they had achieved gold, how they were going to use it in relationship to books and manuscripts. Um, for manuscripts, of course, you have both the inside and the outside. And a lot of the recipes had to do with painting miniatures and writing in gold or silver. Again, that was not what I was after. I was after how they applied um, gold, particularly, sometimes also silver, to leather and to parchment for book covers. There were recipes for two kinds of book covers. Um, you get the treasure bindings that we all know from early um, um, Rospel books. 
uh, full of um, there were whole gold plates, either engraved or repoussé work, and particularly Theophilus goes to a great deal of detail how you made those. Then there is the um, concept of gilding the whole of the covers, which if you unravel it, because they're very, very vague about it, um, amounts to powdered gold in a suspension of gum, tragacant, all kinds of fish glue, any, anything that can work as an adhesive, uh, added to the whole of the cover. And then you get gold leaf made by beating and beating and beating pieces of gold till it says you can almost see through them, laying them on, on a suitable ground. A great deal of um, time and verbiage is spent on what is a suitable ground. And it varies enormously, both for the gilding on leather and vellum, and then also a bit later in the 16th century, uh, the gilding of edges. Um, I won't go into detail. If anybody's interested, there are a number of methods in my article. But what is, what is fascinating is the differences it made, whether you use, whether you lay gold onto leather, onto parchment, uh, and onto edges, whether it's summer or winter, whether you live in a warm climate or a cold climate, whether you heat the leather or whether you use it cold, what kind of glues you use, what kind of adhesives, uh, made of everything you can think of. Uh, any part of any animal, not necessarily a bone at all, a lot of fish, glue, sturgeon bladder. There's a good recipe for how you make glue out of sturgeon bladder. Um, wheat as well. So there were obviously two different kinds of adhesive wheat paste, what we now call wheat paste, and animal glue. Uh, how you apply it, and then the gold itself. Um, you normally use not straight onto the leather with the adhesive, but sometimes you have an underlayer of an other color, like cinnabar, or and particularly for the edges. The edges were often treated with a whole variety of colors varying from brown to yellow to give a sort of depth to the gold that was then put on. Um, again, how often you applied the gold, how often you burnished the edges, how long you did it. It often says until it is beautiful. So Chris would have liked that. Um, several of these early books and manuscripts actually read like a cookery book. You know, the kind of recipes you get in a medieval cookery book. And I don't know whether any of you has ever tried to cook anything from a medieval cookery book, but the great problem is the lack of precision about how much you use of what and for how long. And this, the same thing goes precisely with um, the recipes for gold tooling. Gold tooling, uh, some tools are described uh, already in the 11th century as showing um, palm leaves, um, vine branches, I mean, quite sophisticated. For decorating edges, they use punches mainly, except for there is one 16th century German treatise on decorating edges, where they not only tell you what tools to use, but also what patterns to make, and there's a whole range of patterns. Uh, very detailed, actually, but that is much later. That's towards the end of the 16th century. Um, a nice bit of timing we get in a manuscript that was written for a monastery because the timing is according to prayers and you leave it for as long as it takes you to say one pater noster, that is the Lord's Prayer, or two of them. Um, so the monks would know how long that was. So that, in a way, is more precise 
than you get in many others. Um, the 16th and 17th century bookbinding manuals written by the book binders themselves or written by somebody who had been visiting a bookbinder and was actually looking at what he was doing, um, the former are better than the latter, go into quite a bit of detail about guild schooling and edgy, edge gilding. The one thing that strikes me when you read it all is the amount of time and trouble involved. Um, when I worked in the British Library, I was responsible for many years for running the conservation bindery, which was also a bindery where they did some tooled work. And watching that and reading those early manuals, modern life really speeded things up and made things more simple. Um, Rhea once asked me when I talked about egg white as a substrate, whether what sort of eggs, whether old eggs or new eggs. Well, actually, Rhea, at the time I didn't answer you, but they were both. Some recipes um, spe specify newly laid eggs, other recipes specify old eggs. Now, and if you don't your egg white to go off, you add arsenic to it. And then it says, but this is not much done. Considering the effects of arsenic, I'm not surprised that it isn't much done. Um, the way that they treated the egg white, either you left it whole, added water, you, be you beat it, um, add all sorts of substances. There is a wide variety for all um, ground and substrates. I want to finish with, um, an, I, I, I will translate it. There is a, long, there is a poem by Jost Amann, who is a German bookbinder who wrote in 1568. And he describes in a poem all the stages he goes through to bind a book and to decorate it. And then in the, the last two lines read, and finally, I gild the edge and that earns me a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam.